Almost? It doesn't matter. Just about? All right. All right. We're going to call tonight's meeting to order. Can we get a roll call, please? Council members Bertrand? Here. Bodor? Brooks? Here. Story? Here. And Mayor Peterson? Here. If you could join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Does staff have any additional materials for tonight's meeting? There are no additional materials tonight. All right. Any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Staff has no changes. Fantastic. Now is the time for public comment. Uh, it's a time for members of the public to address the council on any items not on tonight's agenda. If you would like your name spelled correctly in the minutes, please do write it uh, on the clipboard at the podium. Good evening, Mayor Peterson and members of the City Council. My name is Pam Greninger and I serve as the Secretary to the Capitola Historical Museum Board. And this Sunday, I wanted to invite you all and the public to a um, screening of the movie The Testing Block which was filmed in Capitola and other areas in uh, Santa Cruz County 100 years ago. So this is the centennial uh, screening of the film The Testing Block and the museum and the Cabrillo College History Success Club are screening the film at three o'clock Sunday afternoon at the Capitola Community Center at Jade Street Park. And the story takes place during the California Gold Rush. William S. Hart plays an outlaw who settles down and tries to become a good guy. Eva Novak stars as his wife and Gordon Russell plays the evil Jack Ringe. This will be a fun experience to see. Uh, it's an hour long. It's a Western drama, and the event is free. Of course, the uh, museum always welcomes donations from the public. And I just wanted to invite you again and let the community know about the event that uh, is going to be here on Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Whereabouts was it shot? Well, it says in Capitola. Actually, there it was a like fishing village, like where the Venetian is oh, okay. now. But um, it was shot some in that area and um, other areas. I have not seen the film yet, so I will be there to see it. And Frank Perry, the uh, curator for the museum, has put music to the um, film. So uh, we're all looking forward to that. There will also be a raffle and popcorn. <coughs> and uh, so we, like, like I said, we just wanted to get the word out and uh, hope you can come. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Monica McGuire. I live in District 2, not too far away, and part of Capitola is District 2, so I'm calling, coming because I'm more engaged than I've ever been before in the election season. And 2020 is the whole year, but we've got limited time before March, and there's so many aspects of things we want to be talking about. and encouraging conversation, asking all elected officials to encourage conversation and to encourage as many opportunities for people to see the candidates as possible is really important. And it's a shorter season than usual. So Becky Steinbrenner is not very well known to most people and I know she's not necessarily known to the people in Capitola who live in District 2. So I'm wanting to make sure people know there's someone else running besides the incumbent and that there's only a couple of places so far that people can see both of them speak together and therefore do really good question and answer. Um, one of them will be at Cabrillo College. Um, 
which the date is the 29th. It's a Wednesday evening from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Nope. 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., thank you. And then another one will be even sooner on Monday evening at the Coralitos Women's Club um, starting at 6.30 p.m. as well. And that is just my hope that that will stimulate many more conversations for all of us who really need to combine our best efforts, both countywide and citywide. And you guys do such a great job. I'm really happy to be here saying that. But as well, one of the key issues I hope that we'll all be asking about, and I've mentioned before to you, my husband is one of the few people actually qualified to talk about the health difficulties of electromagnetic frequencies on our bodies. He's not only got an MD, but an electrical engineering degree and a bioengineering master's. And he is giving a talk at the Scotts Valley Library on February 1st from 1 to 3 p.m. And that's a Saturday. And there's the EMF Aware Santa Cruz is putting that on. And it's a really vital topic to all city councils because it's why we want the precautionary principle for 5G. And you have him here as a local resource and we just really want you to be able to call us and check with us any way you'd like. Um, you can reach him through me. My website is monicamaguire.com. My phone number's there even, but monica at monicamaguire.com. You can reach Dr. Carl Merritt through that. And um, I think there was another one I was going to announce. Uh, there's also, yes, I was also thrilled Scotts Valley is doing something else. They are also doing um, an information night on all the um, ballot issues. And Gail Pellerin will be handling that this Saturday from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, at the Scotts Valley High School. So those are just things that it's so good to be able to say, let's all meet up and have really good election season conversations this year. We need it so much. Our future is such at stake. And so appreciate all of you doing your part. Thank you so much. Hope Thank to you. see you at these places. Hello, welcome. Hello. Uh, Marilyn Garrett. I've been coming for years about the dangers of wireless microwave radiation, <coughs> excuse me, from many sources and calling upon elected officials to do what's responsible to protect the public from these exposures. Now, as Monica was speaking, I was recalling in this very room about almost 10 years ago now, Dr. Carl Merritt was here about the rollout of the so-called smart meters, which are pulsing microwave radiation. And he addressed the city council at that time on the biological harm that is known uh, it's a whole range of DNA, strand breaks, neurological system disorders, effects on the fertility, on and on. And Bob Bagan at the time was sitting there, and the council was deciding if they were going to have an ordinance to oppose the smart meter rollout. And Bob Bagan, after listening to Dr. Carl Merritt, made his vote against the smart meters. And he said, frankly, he didn't know the harm. And after listening to Dr. Merritt, he said, I'm scared and I am voting against the smart meter rollout. Uh, Dr. Carl Merritt has a background. He worked in radar when he was in the Canadian Air Force, electrical engineering background, but also knows of the biological damage. One picture I remember from a presentation he did titled uh, Health Impacts of Wireless Radiation showed a young woman who had breast cancer. The four points of the cancer were exactly where the four antennas of the phone were resting against her skin in her bra. This is dangerous technology, and I urge you to do what you can to halt it and halt the rollout of the 5G, which is where they plan to put these uh, antennas on utility poles and light poles every few houses. If you hear Dr. Merritt or listen to this CD I have, you'll get the idea of the, what's on the horizon here. Um, and the mayor of Nevada City, your colleagues here, Renette Senum, 
says the 4G, 5G rollout in the public right of way is a corporate and hostile takeover of our public right of way and with no concern for public health and the environment. I suggest you contact Renette Senum of the Nevada City Council in California. And I have three CDs. Who has a CD player? This is Dr. Martin Paul on this topic, a must listen. So I have three. Anyone who has a CD player, please take it and listen. Let me pass this one. Thank you very much. Let me pack up. Hello, welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Cassandra Flores. I work with United Way of Santa Cruz County. I'm the 211 coordinator for, uh, I mean, for any of you that, that, that doesn't know who was 211 does, uh, it's most likely a referral. <coughs> it, it connects you with nonprofits in the community. So it, like 411 is for businesses. So 211 is just nonprofits and any type of needs that you have, you can dial 211 and they can direct you to who provides the services that are close to you because they ask for your zip code. So they connect you to the closest agency that can help you with your need. And it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it also, uh, I work with the OES for in case of an emergency, they, instead of calling 911 for emergencies, you will be calling 211 for, to, get information on what roads are free or where you can get sandbags when the rains uh, are below, uh, above level and stuff like that. Uh, this year on February 11 is going to be the 211 10 year anniversary as well. So that's why I'm like, I don't know, talking to the community if they want their agency to be a shout out um, on the 211 to contact me. My information can be found on the United Way uh, website. And um, pretty much, you can also text now. You, you text your zip code at 898-211, and then you receive all the services uh, on via text messages, so that's good. That's something that I brought last year because when, when, when I went to the call center, I saw people uh, who were unable to hear and I, I saw that as a as an gap, like, oh, what are we gonna do with the people that are unable to hear well, like, to get those services, so they're they're able to see it on their phone, and then they can send the links of the agency as well, so they can check them their, themselves. As well, this year I also um, came up with a website, so we have a central coast just in case uh, people need services in Monterey or San Benito, so it's two on one. Uh, centralcoast.org, and our website for Santa Cruz is 211santacruzcounty.org. And you can check it out there if you always, I mean, if you see an agency that is not there and should be there, uh, you can also uh, contact me. My information is in contact us, and then you can see all the great job 211 have been doing. As well, on 211, we're trying to, uh, 211 is doing a portal for, it's called Kinship, so that one is going to help uh, foster families, foster care, uh, caregivers to uh, direct them to the services. And then we have a separate uh, call, um, um, specialist receiving those calls that have been going to different trainings to be able to answer any questions that those families um, need, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, so 211 is two on one day. And then you, is, uh, 211 is nationwide, so all United States is gonna like be in, super heavy in social media and putting it out there information. So your picture is gonna be there too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, are there any other members of the public that would like to address the council tonight? Seeing none. Uh, before we move forward on to city council and staff comments, I was remiss in sharing some information about uh, the broadcast of tonight's meeting, so I will do that now. This meeting is Cablecast Live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. It's being recorded to be replayed on the following Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on Charter, Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed from our city website, cityofcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Benjamin Thompson. Thank you for being here, Benjamin. And as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. 
Now we will move on to item five, city council and staff comments. Any comments uh, from staff? Sure, great. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to give you an update on the wharf. We had a dive inspection done on Tuesday of this week um, to see if we could uh, come up with a repair alternative for the failed area that didn't involve uh, bringing a pile driver out. Pile driver by itself is about a hundred thousand dollar uh, mobilization fee. We were successful in determining that the basically the end of the piles that are in the mud are still viable and we can extend the piles using the fiberglass pile we want to use anyway uh, over those piles. So we'll be coming up with a repair alternative and uh, should be significantly cheaper, which will allow us to do a few more. We're aiming to try and uh, rehabilitate all of the marginally, um, pop marginal piles that we identified when we did a dive, report, a dive inspection in 2017. So that's approximately, I want to say 10 piles um, that we could do with this repair technique that should save us significant money. So hopefully uh, by the next council meeting, we'll be bringing a contract to you for that work. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, uh, we'll move on to council comments. Any comments from council members? Council member Bertrand. Yeah, um, today I went to a, uh, an informational hearing on efficient building techniques. Um, very interesting and learned that the uh, Normal way of 16 foot, uh, 16 inch off center is now off the drawing board if you want to have an official energy efficient house. And also learned that the techniques used right now calculate the energy loss even due to nails on the outside. So it's very interesting and hopefully maybe talk to Kitty about it. It's uh, something we could adopt here and making an effort. Thanks. Thank you. New comment? Um, so I, I'm going to try to do this based off of what, how we talked about at our last meeting. So my ask is to bring back um, as an agenda item the process uh, for our plastics ordinance and the implementation of that. I asked a couple of times before, um, but I believe I directed that to a commission, our environmental commission. So I'm gonna try this the different way of asking staff to look into it and coming back with how we implement our plastics ordinance and what we can do to better that process. Thank you. Council member story? No comments. All right. One more. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I forgot. Um, I'd like to agendize for future uh, council members. Um, age friendly cities have that come to us for a presentation from the senior council or the AAA advisory board. Okay. Thanks. Um, that's it. All right. Uh, and I just briefly have a couple comments. February 8th is the next sip and stroll. Uh, so I don't know if they're sold out yet, but I know that they're going to sell out pretty quick if they haven't already. So uh, please get your tickets soon. All of the uh, proceeds from that event go to local nonprofits. Uh, and also today I was in Sacramento for the League of California Cities Policy Committee meetings. Uh, we got a brief overview of the governor's proposed budget, which is quite interesting. Uh, and I am a member of the Community Services Policy Committee, uh, where we discussed the governor's master plan on aging. Uh, and other issues that we'll be focusing on this year include parks, libraries, uh, health and well-being for youth and young adults. So I will keep you posted throughout the year as we continue to work on those issues. Uh, moving on to item six, boards, commissions, and committee appointments. Consider appointments to the Finance Advisory Committee. Do we have a staff report? We do, a very quick staff report. So there's two potential <laughs> appointments for this evening. The first is to appoint the, um, the Chamber of Commerce's nomination to the Finance Advisory Committee. The Chamber of Commerce has made a nomination. I don't have the name right in front of me. I believe it's Pete Cullen, is that yes. correct? And so it's a, the council's job now is to ratify basically their nomination or ask for another nomination from uh, the Chamber of Commerce. And then secondarily, Council Member Bertrand has the opportunity to appoint. I know we've received a number of applications. I don't know if Council Member Bertrand has the opportunity to speak to the applicants for uh, his appointment yet or not. So there's two separate actions, one for the full council, one for Council Member Bertrand. Okay. Um, great. Thank you. Is there any questions from the council about this item? No? Any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? 
Seeing none, we'll bring it back for uh, council deliberation. Let's start with the first one, the chamber's appointment. Uh, Pete Cullen, is there any discussion or deliberation? That's all moved. Well, I'll second. I had an opportunity to work with Pete when he was the president of the Friends of the Santa Cruz Library. Um, so he's extremely qualified, a uh, great supporter of the, our library system here in Santa Cruz County. So I'm happy to second Jock's motion to uh, appoint uh, Pete Cullen. To great. Uh, any further discussion? All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, now we will turn to Councilmember Bertrand. You have the opportunity now, as I understand it, uh, to make your appointment or extend recruitment. So we seek your direction. Um, I'm going to extend the recruitment for uh, next meeting, I guess. Uh, there are three right now. I've only met with one. I set up an appointment with another person, and uh, that had to be postponed due to a conflict, and I'm still trying to contact the third, Tom Evans. <coughs> so I have not met with all of them. So does staff have direction to uh, extend the recruitment? What we'll do is we'll continue this item to the next. We, we won't extend the recruitment. So the recruitment, if you're comfortable with that, is closed at this point, and we'll continue this item to the next meeting. I am really pleased that staff has gotten three recruits. Great. I mean, this is extraordinary, so thank you very much. Of course. Yeah, I think we have enough to consider. Great. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to item seven, the consent calendar. All items listed on the consent calendar will be enacted by one motion uh, in the form listed uh, in the agenda, which is available in the back of the room. Uh, there's no separate discussion on this item unless members of the public or city council request specific items be discussed for separate review. Uh, any items pulled for separate discussion will be considered following our general government items. Is there any member of the public that would like to pull any of these items for separate consideration? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council. Yes, Council Member Story. I didn't necessarily want to pull an item, but I did have a question um, about uh, item B, uh, and it's concerning our cash position. So should we pull it and, or should we vote on the other two first and then answer the questions on the third one, or should staff just, okay. All right, so let's, uh, let's pull item B. We'll vote on A and C, and then any questions you have, uh, Council Member Story, we'll have answered by staff, and then we'll uh, continue to vote on item B. So is there any questions on uh, item A or C? No. Okay. Uh, with that, then we will uh, entertain a motion. I so move to ap approve consent calendar item A and C. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Uh, let's go ahead and, and come to item 7B. Um, I know it's supposed to come after general government and public hearings for the sake of just moving along. Let's go ahead and see what kind of questions we can get answered. Yeah, thank you um, uh, for entertaining my question. I just wanted to ask the city manager because I noticed for the last several months our general fund balance has been uh, significantly in the negative. Um, and I think I do recall the reasons why. Um, but I guess my question was, when the city manager may anticipate that our general fund balance may become positive? So for those of you who aren't familiar with this, the city's cash flow goes, the money goes out relatively linear, linearly throughout the course of the year, but it doesn't come in that same way. And generally our lowest cash, cash position is usually towards the end or middle of December. Um, so at this point, we are near the low point. So for the check registers you're seeing now in our cash position, we are near the low point in terms of our cash position. I would expect, and I have our finance director here who can chime in and help out a little bit more, but I would expect our cash position to climb up through the spring, and usually by May, we usually sort of hit that zero point, if I remember correctly, when I look at our annual cycle. Jim, do you have anything to add? Good evening, Mayor and Council. I would just add that, um, that's available cash. We have cash. It's not like we're operating in a deficit on a line of credit. We have cash. That's just our available cash. And the city manager was absolutely correct that usually we get our uh, second installment of property tax in late May or late April, early May, and that's when we'll flip to the positive side. Right. That's what. Uh, yeah. And I, I understood that we don't necessarily aren't in a negative overall cash position, um, but um, just seeing the general fund and being that uh, large into the negative <laughs> i was you know, yeah. curious about when 
that might turn around. So the, the one other interesting thing, and I won't belabor this point too much, but the interesting thing is, is that the UAL payments on our PERS pension liability, if we pay them at the beginning of the year, PERS now gives us a discount on it. We save three and a half percent. Um, so we do that, and over time, as you'll recall, those PERS, PERS payments have increased significantly. So maybe a few years ago, I want to say it was in the 700000 range? Correct. And now we're at? 1.5. 1.5. And so we're making that on day one of the fiscal year. So that's exacerbating this a little bit. Okay. okay. Thank you for that information. All right. Any further questions? No? Okay. Can we uh, entertain a motion for item 7B then? Yeah. I'll move. Approval of item 7B. Second. Oh. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We're going to move on to item 8, general government and public hearings. Uh, 8A, overview of new state requirements for accessory dwelling units. We have a staff report. Yes, we do. Thank you, Mayor Peterson, council members. <clears throat> I'm here tonight to talk to you about accessory dwelling units or ADUs. Uh, a lot of important developments recently. There were six bills signed into law in October of 2019 that completely changed the way ADUs are processed and approved, and those changes all went into effect as of January 1st, 2020. Staff has been working very closely with the city attorney and planning consultant Ben Noble to draft our new ADU ordinance since those bills were signed into law. The City of Capitola's existing ADU ordinance is not consistent with the new state law, so therefore it is null and void. Uh, ADU applications in the city will be reviewed and approved under uh, the government code until the City of Capitola adopts an ordinance that complies with that code section. There are several general ADU standards that have changed. Jurisdictions must allow <laughs> ADUs in all areas zoned to allow residential uses. Uh, owner occupancy requirements are only permitted for junior ADUs. Jurisdictions may prohibit rentals of less than 30 days in all ADUs and must prohibit short-term rentals in ADUs approved under the limited standard section, which I will describe in depth later. Jurisdictions may also allow the separate sale or conveyance of an ADU from a primary residence if it was constructed by a qualified nonprofit organization under AB 587. This part is optional and will be raised as a discussion point in the staff report for the next meeting. Uh, jurisdictions may not require correction of non-conforming zoning conditions as a condition of approval, and no fire sprinklers may be required unless they are required in the primary residence. And last but not least, all standards, including our maximum floor area ratio, must be waived to permit at least an 800 square foot ADU, 16 feet in height with four foot side and rear yard setbacks. So if that just sounds like gibberish, what that means is that even if a lot has an existing dwelling that is at or over the maximum floor area ratio, the city has to permit an 800 square foot ADU. So this, this pretty drastically changes how we um, do planning in the city, especially in our R1 zones. The new laws also change the review and approval process. Limited standards ADUs uh, must be reviewed and approved administratively with no discretionary hearing or public hearings, sorry, discretionary review or public hearings if they meet minimum standards, which I will describe in a later slide. Um, these types of ADUs include internal ADUs, which are uh, ADUs converted from existing structures, including primary residences, attached and detached garages, and any accessory structure, even if the structure is non-conforming, meaning sitting right on a lot line, for example. Uh, detached ADUs on single-family parcels, internal ADUs in non-livable multifamily spaces such as storerooms, uh, boiler rooms, passageways, attics, basements, or garages, and detached ADUs on multifamily parcels. The time to act on a permit application has also been reduced to 60 days uh, from 120 days unless the application is concurrent with an application to build a new single-family residence. So I'm going to review the three types of ADUs in the following slides. Uh, those three types are limited standards, full standards, and ADUs subject to design permits. The first type I'll review is the uh, limited standards ADUs. The two types of ADUs that must be reviewed and approved under limited standards, uh, sorry, there are two types of ADUs that must be reviewed and approved under limited standards on single family lots. Uh, those two types are one ADU or junior ADU with an existing or proposed single-family unit or accessory structure, 
they are allowed an expansion of up to 150 square feet, but only for ingress and egress. Exterior access is required, and setbacks must be sufficient for fire safety. And the second type is one new construction detached ADU on lots with an existing or proposed single-family unit. Uh, those cannot be more than 800 square feet, 16 feet in height, uh, four foot side and rear setbacks. And these can actually be combined with a junior ADU, which when combined with the primary dwelling actually creates a triplex on the property. There are also two types of ADUs that must be reviewed and approved under limited standards on multifamily lots. Uh, the first type is multiple ADUs within an existing multifamily building. These must be converted from space not used as livable space. Uh, I listed the examples before of a storage rooms, boiler rooms, garages, um, but they do have to uh, meet code standards, obviously. Local jurisdictions must allow 25% of existing units in a building or one unit, whichever is greater. So for example, a 12 unit building would get three conversion ADUs if they had three spaces they could convert. Uh, and the second type is not more than two detached ADUs on lots with existing multifamily units. Those obviously have to be detached, uh, and they have the 16-foot height and 4-foot side and rear setback requirements. So next up, we have the full standards, full review standards. These standards are applied to additions and new detached ADUs that do not qualify for the administrative approval under the limited standards section. <coughs> This category is li pretty limited. It's just one story attached ADUs and detached ADUs between 800 and 1200 square feet. Applications for these types of ADUs will be reviewed and approved administratively under standards very similar to the limited standards uh, ADUs, plus some objective standards. Local jurisdictions are expressly allowed to regulate parking with uh, major exceptions that I'll address later height, landscaping, architectural review, maximum unit size, and standards that prevent adverse impacts on uh, historic uh, properties listed on the historic register. Local jurisdictions are also prohibited from enforcing minimum lot size requirements. That was a very large uh, change. No setbacks are required for conversions of existing structures, even if they're non-conforming. Um, the only setbacks I've mentioned are the four foot side and rear setbacks and um, there's a minimum size that we have to allow of 150 square feet for efficiency units and the maximum for one bedroom is 850 square feet and 1,000 square feet for two or more bedrooms. As I mentioned previously, while the new law mentions the ability of local jurisdictions to require parking, uh, it also exempts most ADUs from those parking requirements. No parking spaces can be required for internal, junior, or attached ADUs. In addition, no parking spaces can be required for detached ADUs if they are located within one half mile walking distance of public transit, uh, located within a National Register Historic District or other historic district, uh, when on-street parking permits are required but not offered to the occupant of the ADU, and when there's a car share vehicle pickup or drop-off location within one block. However, the first exemption on that list, uh, the one for ADUs within one half mile walking distance of public transit, exempts most of the city from parking requirements as shown here. The area in gray, which includes most of the Cliffwood Heights neighborhood, is the only area where city could require parking for those detached ADUs. However, there are several bus stops along Park Avenue that are currently inactive and not included in the previous map. If that bus route were to be made active, all types of ADUs on every parcel in the city of Capitola would be exempt from parking requirements. Given the fact that all types of ADUs uh, will be exempt from parking requirements in the majority and potentially all of Capitola, the Planning Commission may want to consider removing all parking requirements for ADUs from the, ordin from the ordinance. This flowchart gives an overview of how each type of ADU would move through the approval process. Uh, the limited standards one, they would submit an application there would be a 60-day planning and building review. Uh, that review can only <laughs> be made up of those three standards I mentioned, 800 square feet, four foot side and rear setbacks, and 16 feet in height. And uh, then basically we have to just, it's a mandatory approval. Second type is the full review standards. Uh, submit an application, same 60-day review period, uh, subject to the general requirements, uh, but then we can also uh, hold it to the development standards and some objective design standards as well. Uh, and then it's an administrative approval. And then for the third type, there's actually a design permit required. So they would submit their application um, subject to the general requirements for all ADUs, the development standards, objective design standards. Um, and there's actually a, 
it's the equivalent of a variance in terms of ADUs, but it's a, a deviation from those standards would also go for a design permit and go to, all those would go to planning commission for approval. State law allows local agencies to amend their ordinances to incorporate the policies, procedures, and other provisions applicable to the creation of an ADU only if the provisions are consistent with the government code. However, state law does not limit the authority of local agencies to adopt less restrictive requirements for the creation of ADUs. At their January 16th, 2020 meeting, the Planning Commission requested guidance from the City Council regarding the approach they should take towards the City of Capitola's ADU ordinance and whether to be more or less permissible. Sorry, permissive. So let me start out by saying that the, uh, the state law is very prescriptive and permissive. Uh, for example, we must follow, sorry, we must allow an ADU on any lot that is zoned uh, to allow single family and multifamily residential uses. Uh, we cannot require minimum lot size. We can only require those maximum four foot side and rear setbacks. Um, we can't require setbacks for conversions of existing structures. We can't require parking for most ADUs. Uh, we have to consider approve uh, ADU permits administratively. It's, it's a very long list. It's very prescriptive. So what, what can we actually fidget with? Um, there are only a few limited areas in which a local agency is allowed to be less restrictive, such as parking requirements, setbacks, height, uh, the maximum attached ADU size with new single family dwellings, uh, the review process, and owner occupancy. So I'll start with uh, parking, because that was the first thing on that list. Currently, the state law would only allow the city to require one parking space for detached ADUs in the Cliffwood Heights area. All other ADU types in all other areas would be exempt from parking requirements. The city council could direct staff to remove parking requirements from all ADUs, and that's actually what we'd like to recommend tonight. In terms of setbacks, I've mentioned this multiple times now, the four foot side and rear setback is what is in the state law. The city council could direct staff to include first and second story setbacks of less than four feet. Uh, however, in order to adequately address drainage and protect the privacy and solar access of neighboring properties, staff recommends the city go with the state standard rear and side setback of four feet. In terms of height, uh, under the new state law, a local agency must allow an ADU of 16 feet in height. There is no maximum in there about two-story ADUs, so the draft ordinance is going to include the two-story ADU height limit from the existing Capitola uh, ADU ordinance, which is 22 feet. The City Council could direct staff to include a height greater than 16 feet for one-story ADUs or greater than 22 feet for two-story ADUs. However, in order to protect the privacy and solar access of the neighboring properties, staff would recommend we go with the state standards of 16 feet and the proposed one we have in the draft ordinance of 22 feet for two-story. In terms of maximum attached ADU size, this is getting kind of into the specifics here, um, but for only attached ADUs, the state requires that we include a maximum ADU size of at least 850 square feet for a one bedroom attached ADU and at least 1,000 square feet for a two or more bedroom ADU. Uh, the city council could direct staff to include a maximum that's greater than that. Um, the state standard, however, can already result in ADUs that are larger than the primary residence in some cases in Capitola. So staff recommends the city council just stick with the state standard maximum ADU size of 850 square feet and 1,000 square feet. In terms of the review process, uh, I mentioned that the, the state requires us to process most of these administratively and within 60 days from the date that we receive a complete application. Uh, the City Council could direct staff to make the review and approval process administrative for all ADUs and reduce the required maximum review times, say from 60 days to 30 days. Um, however, staff, because this is a brand new thing and there's so much different, we would just recommend that you stick with the ones that they've given us of 60 days and administrative on the uh, first two types and uh, more, a discretionary on the third. And then owner occupancy. So this one's a little convoluted in that the state law prohibits owner occupancy requirements on ADUs between 2020 and 2025. Um, while this provision sunsets in 2025, any ADUs approved during that period shall remain exempt. And state law requires, on the flip side, that junior ADUs have an owner occupancy deed restriction. The, uh, you can't really change those. Um, you could act, make it so that in 2025, 
we start requiring them again. But this is such a shifting field here that we would just recommend just for now not including an owner occupancy requirement except on the junior ADUs. Uh, you could, however, go one step further and uh, direct staff to either not enforce or remove owner occupancy deed restrictions that are already in place on ADUs to approved prior to 2020. Uh, this is something that we're just requesting direction from you on, um, on that last section there. In terms of next steps, the draft ADU ordinance will be presented to the Planning Commission at the next regular meeting on February 6th. Once the Planning Commission has approved the draft ordinance, it must be reviewed and adopted by you. The new ordinance must then be sent to the California Department of Housing and Community Development within 60 days. Uh, HCD is going to review those. Uh, they may submit written findings in regards to our uh, compliance with the government code section. If HCD finds that we're not in compliance, we have to do one of two things, either amend our ordinance or adopt the ordinance without changes, but include findings explaining how we think we comply with that government code section. And uh, just one last point, ADU ordinances are, uh, uh, ordinance updates are exempt from CEQA. So in summary, we would like to receive guidance from, for the Planning Commission on how permissive we should be with the draft ordinance. I can return to those slides if you'd like to discuss them individually. Uh, and at this point, I'll hand it back over to you for discussion and questions. Thank you. Uh, does council have any questions on this item? Yes, council member Story. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you. That was a lot. I hope we can go <laughs> back to each one of the areas in which mm -hmm. you wanted some direction for us. Um, but particularly focused on the parking requirement or the lack thereof uh, based upon the public transit uh, exception. And maybe if you could go back to that slide. It's like the map? Uh, the map, okay. yeah. So just to, uh, to understand, as I understand, the, the government code section says that parking um, requirement, uh, one, the government code normally would allow parking requirements um, uh, under Section X, but there's an exception if it's within a half a mile of public transit. What is defined, and how have you defined public transit for the purposes of that map? These are active bus stops. That's all the dots in black. The black dots yeah. are all actual bus stops. Mm -hmm. So the only, the only ones that are not active are the ones right along Park Avenue on the right there in the green section, and that's what exempts that in the previous, in this slide. Okay. That's why that area is not highlighted. So, and so all the rest of Capitola is within a half mile of a bus stop. Yeah. Okay. This is the result of a sort of one size fits all approach from the state where I, this one in particular was not really designed for a city as small as ours. So usually these would be much more spread out and you would have a lot more that where you could require parking. But in our situation, we have so many in such a small area that it just, in effect, just exempts everything pretty much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for that mm -hmm. clarification. Any other questions from council? Questions? Yes, Council yeah. Member Bertrand. So, um, <laughs> I read in here we have some discretion as far as the length of time that a owner can rent an ADU. And on the packet, I'm not sure which page it was because the copy doesn't give me the page number, but. Um, a local agency shall require that a rental of the accessory dwelling unit created pursuant to this subdivision be a term longer than 30 days, and we have some discretion over that. So is you didn't cover that. Um, am yeah, I misreading? We might have this? missed that one, but that, that's another area that we just, we included that as, uh, we, we went with the optional way of applying that to every, every ADU. But and partially because that's something where we only currently allow them within our CV zone anyway. So so we have the option of saying whether 30 days or 365 days. That's my sense. Only with everything except for junior ADUs. Junior ADUs, you have to limit them to. Uh, you have to limit they them? Can have, they can have short-term rentals. The rest of them can't. Okay. So the way we have it right now, uh, a JDU can be 30 days, can be 30 days, but everything else has to be longer than that. And what's the length of time that it has to be at least? Or is there a minimum? I'm just trying to understand that. Of 30 days. Yeah, sorry. So that therefore it's a long-term rental and not short-term vacation. 
okay in that sense okay so what I'm getting at is if we could do 30 day 30 day 30 day basically that takes the the rental unit off of the housing stock because it's you know appealing to people who want to stay for 30 days not permanently so my other question is in terms of arena numbers at 30 days rental if we agree to that as opposed to long-term rental like a year or two years or three years how does that affect the arena numbers what we're meeting in terms of arena so for arena numbers um the market rate units would you know a new adu would count as a new unit for market rate units so arena numbers are broken up into different um, affordability ranges okay and unless there was a deed restriction tied to the adu in which we were um, re requiring that the adu be at a certain market um, um, affordability rate right then it would you could check off the box for arena numbers that say low income numbers but um, without any um, deed restriction in place and s for affordability so that it's rented at that level the only arena number that this will address is just your market rate housing which is the largest portion of our arena numbers but the one that we're almost about we're about to meet that actually currently because yeah, think, yeah we're pretty yeah. close so my sense of the arena numbers is we're trying to create permanent housing stock. And a 30-day rental, to me, does not do that in, in the sense of having a family stay there, you know, two, three years or something like that. 30 days, is, is that really qualifying as something that fulfills the arena requirements? Yes. So um, wow. for market, but so to break it down for you, a vacation rental is typically less than 30 days. So once we say 30 days or more, you're talking about a long-term rental, and it's usually somebody taking on a one to two year lease or longer. Um, and, and that's, so don't think of it as increments of 30 days. It's usually, it's 30 or more. So okay. it's, it's your typical long-term rental. Okay, so, so the potential I'm thinking of is someone renting perhaps at a higher rate because this is a demanding area you know, in terms of excess accessibility in terms of vacation stuff like that but taking essentially that apartment off of the regular market for someone who wants to live here and work here and have their kids go to school and stuff like that that that's what i'm thinking about okay but and technically it does qualify for arena yes okay. 30 days okay. so i want to correct that what i said earlier too so we here's here's what the state law says it says local agencies shall require that a rental of the accessory dwelling unit created pursuant to the subdivision, and this is uh, applying to the limited standards ADUs, be for a term longer than 30 days. So you can't do Airbnbs, for example, in any on any of the limited standards ADUs, and then it's up to us whether we would like to apply that to all the rest of the types, uh, so which we have in our draft ordinance, and you could tell us not to if you'd like. Okay, and, and that's by basically saying 30 days or long or mm -hmm. up to a year or something you know, yeah. put some requirement there okay that's how we do in our current code too so. Hist oh. historically when we did the most recent zoning code update there was uh, guidance not to allow short-term rentals within our adus because we really treat those as part of our housing stock yeah and that's what i want to keep and so i just want to clarify that the other question i have i got a little lots of little points mm -hmm. but um i can deal with those later in terms of water requirements, we, we don't have our own agency here. We have SoCal Water District and also for sanitation. And so I was a little unclear in terms of getting a permit to build in, or getting or having to have a meter or cut, connect up with the existing meter or have a new sanitation line or connect up with the existing sanitation line. Could you so clarify So the state that? law is very prescriptive in terms of water um, providers, uh, of which, as you mentioned, we are not. Uh, however, uh, Soco Creek Water District has, I haven't looked at Santa Cruz yet, but San Soco Creek is interpreting it as um, conversion ADUs from existing space do not need a new water meter. And That's like the JDU. Uh, yeah, well, not necessarily just junior, anything converted, so internal or junior. Um, those are distinct. Internal or junior? Okay. Yeah, uh, so juniors are very specific in terms of the 500 square feet or okay, less. Okay, the size. Okay, um, got it. The kitchen requirements. There's, there's different things for juniors. Okay, got it. Um, but it's a no water meter for an existing house with a conversion ADU. However, any new constructions, so that's a new attached, new detached, uh, those all do require uh, a meter. Okay. Yeah. Even though the intent of the, the new laws from the state is that we want to increase housing, but in this case, that's going to offset 
the ability to build those housing and if we can't get a meter, right? Mm -hmm. no I, I've double checked with them and, and discussed this with Soquel Creek and they assure me they have met with their attorneys and that their application of this they feel confident in. So, so in effect, the, the only new housing we're going to be able to cr create is JDUs or internal ADUs. Oh, no, you can do it. It just costs a little bit more money. Oh, how much more money? Can you give me an idea? I believe the difference. Well, <laughs> so not required for conversion. So there's there's no new meter. And then there's a split, actually, with the um, new construction ADUs. And it's a difference between about 9,000 for an ADU of 640 square feet or less and about 20,000 for anything over 640 square feet. And I believe that has to do with the size of the water meter and the projected demand. Okay, so, so we can do it, it's just the, the meter is gonna, mm -hmm. okay, depending on use and stuff. Okay, yeah. thank you. Is that all your questions? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, that's council questions. We'll bring it now to uh, public comment. If there is any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item, now would be the time. Good evening, welcome. Hi, Peter Wilk, Planning Commissioner. So I wanted to explain why we kicked this up the, up the chain in terms of some of these requirements and, and asking you guys for guidance. And it's a general attitude, I'm, at, least, at least that's what I was looking for. I know Ed Newman was also kind of on board for this. Um, you know, generally we looked at the general plan and the existing code for guidance and we interpret that the best of our ability saying that th those are the wishes of Capitola but this is a new issue and it's a very political issue frankly and it involves how do we want to embrace the affordable housing crisis do we want to go with open arms do we want to say no we're already built out and I didn't see that since this is a new, fairly new issue I didn't get a guidance from the general plan on that and certainly you could just say well any change to our municipal code we're gonna fight because we didn't put it there but but again this is something that the state is taking a, a very strong attitude with and it, it seems like Santa Cruz at least has embraced it because their setback criteria is less than four feet for example and I don't necessarily need guidance on whether we want 16 feet or four feet, but I would like to have an attitude if someone has a new ADU, it's a new construction, and it's a nice unit and it serves the needs, but it's, say, two feet from the lot line. Should our attitude be, look, we want to fight this tooth and nail. We're overbuilt. We don't want to, you know, any any opportunity we can to reject these kinds of things we want to take because it's going to create new traffic, you know, all the issues, right? Or do we want to say, no, we understand what the state wants and we're going to embrace it as best as possible. So when we get an application that we think is reasonable, even though it may be 17 feet high or, th you know, what kind of attitude should we take? And, and I, and I think Ed would agree with me at least, don't feel that the current general plan or the current municipal code gives us that kind of guidance and we should turn to our elected officials for that guidance. Thank, Thank you. you. I would say that uh, in that type of a situation, we do have a section called deviations, which I mentioned very briefly in here that would allow you to do the equivalent of a variance. So anything that deviates from any of those standards, the planning commission will have an opportunity to approve those. Um, and there's a very specific list of nine findings that they'll need to make to approve that. So when you get to see the ordinance, um, you'll, get, you'll get to read through those findings that they need to make to approve those types of projects. Great, thank you. Uh, seeing no other members of the public, we'll bring it back to council for deliberation and a vote. Uh, does council comments? <coughs> council member story? Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I, for me, it would be helpful if we went through each one of these uh, areas in which uh, the Planning Commission and the staff were looking for direction uh, from us so that we can just maybe in an orderly way address each item with that said I'm gonna give my perspective um, is that you know the state has mandated certain um, public policy direction concerning providing additional housing and that is imposed upon us and we must accept those requirements and, and standards however um, 
we are an extremely congested and built out community um, and particularly have the impacts of parking is greater on Capitola than it would be in some other communities, particularly in Santa Cruz or in Watsonville. I think that we have a much higher sensitivity toward more cars parked on our streets. In many neighborhoods, there's already not enough parking. Um, uh, and so with that, in balancing the interest of housing, and I assume that the state regulations are for, uh, are moving forward uh, that public policy basis, which we must accept and follow, and to that extent we should. But for the where we can protect the community and have more um, ability to respond to our local residents about the potential issues that this may create, I don't think that we should be more permissive than what the state is imposing upon us. So that's my general overview. And it's not to say that, you know, if there are variance situations, we currently work through those. There will be those uh, deviation possibilities, but they should go through a formal review process if somebody wants to deviate uh, from what the state requirements are uh, and what we have ultimately adopted to, I think, be able to control and protect our community. So that, that's my overall statement, and then we can try to address each one of those, and I'll respond with kind of that Different approach overall, in mind. Okay, uh, we will go through those one at a time. Do you have any overall comments on this before we move forward? Yeah, just to, we'll um, the, to, to the speaker's point, um, I, I'm in mostly agreement with council member's story. I think that we need to give this some time on um, uh, to see what other jurisdictions are doing, um, to see what's working and what's not working for, for in other cities. Um, I'd ideally just like to see uh, to see staff come back like in a year or so on how are they dealing with um, improving the affordability of ADUs and, and things of that nature. Um, the only piece I would, would disagree with council member's story is regarding the parking um, section. So, and I know we'll talk about that, but um, so that's where I would differ. Council member Bertrand, general comments? Yeah, um, I'm very happy that um, Peter came from planning and gave us a, a sense of why, why it came back to us. So I appreciate that. Um, so in general, I, I do look for the planning to be giving guidance and to see how a particular plan and someone's project fits into the neighborhood. And, and I think that's their purview and I respect their judgment on that. And if there are gonna be uh, points that we could uh, make variances on, I'll look for the ordinance to see if I feel good about those variances. But one that comes up to my mind and Sam sort of jumped in on it. Uh, parking is a big one, I have to admit. So Yvette, you know, We'll see how this works out. But another one that came up that was listed is in terms of traffic impact. And I, I heard that and you haven't uh, stressed that. So is that one of the variance issues, you know, and, and that's gonna come up? I'm not sure and I'm not sure how that actually is, is understood in terms of traffic impact, you know? It is explicitly mentioned that we can uh, put standards in there related to traffic impacts, but it's not really expanded upon in the state code, so. I would love to know what that means, mm. okay? Because traffic is a major issue in the city, and um, what is actually meant by this whole thing of traffic impact? Not clear to me. Thanks. All right, so let's go through these uh, one at a time. These are the items that you're seeking guidance on, correct? That are on the screen right now? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's start with parking requirements. Any council comments on the parking requirements other than what was already mentioned? Any further comments on this end? Well, I just uh, as I understand the request was, I mean, one, whether to be more permissive for the Cliffwood Heights area. Just, that's the only place where we currently have any discretion. Yes. Um, so in keeping with uh, my approach to this, I would recommend that we not be more permissive even in that area because one, the state exemption 
in my mind, is based on a false premise. That because somebody lives within a half a mile of a bus stop, they're going to take the bus and not have a car. And we know that that's false. That is not going to happen. Um, and with, and it's also bus stops are not in our control. They could flow and or change and go. They're not on Park Avenue. They may be on Park Avenue. They may go away someplace else. Um, and I just think instead of giving up what modicum of control that we have, we should just be consistent with what the state requirements are, but where we have the, uh, the ability to require the parking or consider that, we should maintain uh, that power uh, to do that. Um, and so with that, I mean, my view would be not to be more permissive uh, concerning the parking requirements, um, but the rest of it's already kind of mandated and, and currently as things stand, we don't have the ability to uh, control the parking and we'll have to live with that. Thank you. Council Member Bertrand? Um, depending on what the parking requirements are, that could mean an ADU could be put in or not put in. And so I'd like to get a better understanding of what this would mean in terms of the City of Capitola when this is presented to the Planning Commission. So um, I did attend a talk uh, about a year ago, and the whole emphasis of the talk was that putting parking requirements is into a plan increases the cost considerably. And so for someone actually trying to put an ADU in or a project in, putting that parking requirement increases the cost quite a bit. So does that mean if we put those parking requirements in that will depress ADUs being built in the city and therefore not providing uh, residences uh, for potential you know, people that want to live in capital? So I want to understand that issue before I rule on that one. Yeah, from, just from personal experience, I think um, a parking requirement dissuades um, ADUs from being built in a lot of cases simply because they don't have anywhere to provide it. Right. Um, I don't think it necessarily increases cost. I think it's just prohibitive sometimes because the lot's just, there's nowhere to put an additional parking space. So. Okay, so if we had a parking requirement, it's not because, you know, okay, there's just no place, right? Okay, mm -hmm. okay thank you. Yes, Councilman Story. If I, if I yes, may, please. just... And correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of the of the uh, government code, it does allow communities for particular ADUs to have parking requirements, but then under section uh, XI, or Roman numeral three XI, um, it says if when if there's a garage, carport, or curving parking structure is demolished in conjunction with the construction of an accessory <laughs> dwelling unit are converted to an accessory dwelling unit, the local agency shall not require those off-street parking spaces be replaced. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't like it, but there's a mechanism here if somebody really felt that they could benefit and wanted to provide and they had a carport, they could demolish the carport, put in an ADU, and not have additional parking and we would have to live by that. And so, I mean, to me, there is there is a means mm -hmm. for people to um, get around that mm -hmm. um, threshold. Um, and so, and I just don't, I mean, to me, again, the traffic and the parking is so impactful from us. I don't know that we should be more permissive than what the government code already mm -hmm. allows. I, I think I could go along with that, but based on your response, you know, the reality is that we can't really do it anyway. There's not the cost element that I was thinking about. That's what you're sort of saying. The space is not there to provide an extra spot. Is All right, but I, <laughs> yeah, I think he was making a slightly different He's point. He's telling yes, a different yeah. point. I'm yeah, just yeah. going back to what you said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I would agree with what uh, Council Member Story is saying that um, the the new laws, the new California laws are um, quite generous already and I would be concerned with giving up any more local control than, than we're already having to. Um, however, I'm, I'm curious, rather than having a blanket statement that no parking is required, being more permissive, 
is it possible to say that we do still have the one parking space required, but the planning commission has the right to, on a case by case basis, set, determine that a project uh, has more value, even if it doesn't have the parking space and kind of void that? Is that an option for them to choose on a case by case basis if it needs a parking space or not? Or do we have to choose one or the other? The, the movement is towards objective standards and that sounds very subjective to me, so I don't think uh, so. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, any further discussion on this particular, on the parking? No? Do we need a motion? Yeah, are we gonna vote on each one of these individually? I, I don't. Or can we? This is just our intent, I think. You're just looking yeah. for yeah. direction. Oh, you're just looking I, I, for direction. I don't think you need any motions. You know, we're no. hearing from at least three of you that, that you'd like to keep the, uh, the state standards for parking and you not can, go beyond that. You can hear from four of us in okay. agreement on that. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. All right, moving on. What was the next item on the bullet point list there? Setbacks. Setbacks. And if the basic feedback is stick with the state stay minimums, then I think that the direction is relatively clear. The only other topic area that I think we needed to focus on really is this question about the um, deed restrictions. Deed. Owner occupancy. Owner occupancy deed restrictions. So <laughs> if, 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 if the overall direction is, you know, we don't need to talk about height, setback, all these other uh, topic areas, if, if the direction from council is consistent with that first one is, hey, let's, let's, this is a big move to take the state standards and states moved us a long way on ADUs. Let's see how that goes first and let's not go beyond that. This is the only other one I think that probably does require a little bit of deliberation. Yeah, we have a question from council member Bertrand. So when I hear about, um, Deed restrictions, owner occupancy requirements. I wonder if this is sort of a legacy idea. You see, I mean, so I wouldn't used, when I first heard about ADUs, there was always the owner occupied, and you know, it was just sort of an add-on, and it was sort of okay because the owner was always there. And I'm just sort of wondering if it's sort of a mind thing in that sense. So, so here's the issue. Let me just try to reframe it a little bit. So historically, when the city has allowed people to put ADUs in, we've required them to record a deed restriction that they're gonna live in one of the two right. units. Um, this has been longstanding policy in the city, and I think it was really intended not to have the people turn their houses into duplexes and move out of town, to convert them into sort of rental housing, that it was an intent to try to preserve neighborhoods and having owners living in their houses. Um, new state law doesn't let you do that anymore can't do that for any any new ADU that comes online in the next five years. So the question is, is for those existing folks who play by the rules and have signed these deed restrictions, would the city want to reconsider them because new ADUs don't have to, or do we say, look, that was the rules that were in place at the time that they did this um, and they need to live with it. Now, to get back to your legacy question, this question of is it just so, sort of a historical remnant, we did actually spend some time talking about this during the zoning code update with the general plan, and the council discussed it, went back and forth, and ultimately decided that it was important to keep that owner occupancy re requirement. So it may have had uh, long historical roots, but it has been re revisited over time. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Yes, Councilman Mishore. Sure. What's the explanation for the sunset of, as, and as I understand it, the prohibition against requiring owner occupancy is expires. going to expire in 2025? I would bet you anything that before 2025 comes, that date is extended. I'm just, I, I'm not, I don't understand the logic either. And staff? No, I don't know the logic, but I'm guessing that it was probably a a debated point and this was the way they came to compromise. It was, it was a compromise mm -hmm. to pass the legislation. And, mm -hmm. um, I would be surprised if it wasn't extended, but we'll see. Maybe there's statewide backlash. It is an opportunity though for us to learn from it. What, during this five years, if when we're seeing more um, without the requirement of owner occupancy to be able to decide is this something we should lift we haven't had a problem in the last five years or we should never lift this because we've had so many problems so it's really an opportunity for us to learn from it if we yeah i mean i wouldn't be interested in retro actively setting you know going back on on the decision that previous council members have made and deliberated upon i think to your point katie that we should do this wait and see sort of like what i mentioned earlier about 
you know, what's working, what's not working in other cities, and, and then receiving some feedback at a later time, like in a year or so. Yeah, I'll go with see that on us, yeah. Could we consider it on a case-by-case -case application basis? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. <laughs> because it, it would be specifically tied to the owner. So would you have like, you know, owner interviews? <laughs> that would be objective. Well, with that look on your face, I was too. <laughs> I, I knew the second I asked the question, uh, I wanted to pull it back. Uh, thank you. Person of few words, but many <laughs> facial expressions. <laughs> okay, so do we have, am I understanding that we have a consensus not to remove prior deed restrictions on previously approved ADUs? Yeah. Yes. yes. Staff? Okay, cool. Moving on. That concludes. Well, that's oh, it. that's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. We're going to move on then to item 8B, consider a new photo traffic enforcement contract. Staff report. Captain Daly, would you like me to run it from here? Yeah, that'd be great. Well, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Peterson and council members. Um, I'm here this evening to present on the red light photo enforcement program that we have and, um, and would like council to consider a contract between <clears throat> Vera Mobility for continued red light enforcement on 41st Avenue. So let me start with a little bit of history of the program. So for the past 14 years, the city has had a partnership with American uh, Traffic Solutions, which is now uh, Vera Mobility. Uh, to operate two red light cameras on 41st Avenue. Uh, the, two, uh, the, the whole point behind the program was to, in, to enhance safety on 41st Avenue because it is one of the major thoroughfares in Santa Cruz County and the busiest, inter, or the busiest thoroughfare in, in uh, Capitola. <clears throat> so currently we have uh, two red light cameras on 41st Avenue. The first one is at 41st Avenue in Claire's right there by Burger King and the second one is 41st Avenue at the Capitola Mall entrance. The current contract expired on December 6, 2019, and we're currently operating with a 90-day extension. So why do we have this program? Because traffic safety is a priority for the community and the police department. Um, prior to the installation of the red light cameras, we had 66 collisions on 41st Avenue. Uh, the primary goals for implementing this program was to, the four things was improve safety, reduce collisions, increased driver awareness and changing uh, the driver behavior. So the next thing is uh, the results of the program. So since the inception in 2005, we've had a, uh, and this is comparing the 2005 data to the current 2019 data, uh, that we've decreased by 60% accidents on 41st Avenue at Claire's. It's been a, re a de decrease of 89% of accidents at Capitola Mall and 41st Avenue and an overall uh, decrease of 79% of accidents along the whole corridor. And the next slide we'll go into, this just out, outlines the, the data from 2005 through, to, to, through the current 2019. You'll see that the blue represents the 41st Avenue and Claire's, and those numbers are the collisions. Uh, the orange will represent 41st Avenue and the mall entrance, and then the white represents the 41st Avenue corridor. So you can see on the far left, is prior to the installation of the red light cameras and then you can see it gradually um, trickles down to the current data so it's, it's showing that there's an increased uh, that the, the main goal is changing that driver behavior so let's look at the costs uh, currently uh, the the contract is that is fifty one hundred dollars per month per camera so it's per approach so we have two approaches the one at 41st and Claire's and the one at 41st in the, in the mall entrance. So the total, total cost uh, per month is $10,200. And the, this contract is, is basically outlined to where if the city does not collect the $10,200 for adjudicated fines, then it's, it's called a flex payment plan. plan so the, the money actually gets deferred. Um, to date, we have actually never collected over $10,200 a month um, in fines. So that, so we've never exceeded that. And uh, one point of clarification, that, that residual amount that isn't paid gets deferred and then excused at the end of the contract. So right. it's never paid. 
And so uh, the recommendation from staff is to authorize a city manager or his designee in, to enter in a co five year contract with Vera Mobility, formerly ATS, uh, for, for red light uh, photo enforcement on 41st Avenue. And with that, I'm open for any questions. Questions from council? Council member Story? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Captain Daly. Um, my question is the cameras, when they take the picture of the drivers running the red light, what do they actually take a picture of? So there's, there's actually uh, there's three pictures and a video. And what happens, there's a picture of the overall intersection. There's a close-up of the license plate, the front license plate. And then there is also a picture of the rear. And then there's a video. And so what happens when that initial violation, or we call it a, an incident, because it's not a violation until an officer approves it, that gets um, then forwarded to ATS, which is out of Arizona. Mm -hmm. And then, and then they've kind of, there's a filter process. So what happens is they look at the, reg the vehicle's registration, and they compare it to the driver and see if it, there's a match. And then there's parameters that we can set. So one of the things is if it's um, very close to the limit line, those get automatically filtered. And so once we set those parameters, those that get vetted out are then sent to an officer who actually physically reviews them and matches the license plate with the driver information. Right. So you can identify the driver of the vehicle in most instances. Yes. And in fact, the state of California, it's a driver responsibility. So we actually have to identify the driver. So what we do is we pull up the, the still photo and then we, we also have access to Cal Photo, which is the DMV database and we compare those two and so that's how we make the verification and when the, the officer who uh, approves the um, incident um, is that one of our officers or is that uh, a the contractor that does that so the 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 or Vera mobility actually does the first kind of filter Mm -hmm. um, but then any of the, the incidents are, uh, are then sent to an officer, and then we have in the officers that are assigned to the motor unit are then responsible for viewing those, and then they actually have to issue that citation. So, okay, so an officer with our department actually, well, issues, actually the issues the citation after reviewing the um, camera uh, photographs or, and video. Um, has anyone ever successfully contested one of these citations? <laughs> We've actually had a very high success rate with, with our mm -hmm. current court systems. There has been, um, I'm not to say that it's perfect, but we've had some that have been challenged um, through attorneys and they've um, been successful. But I know that our, our success rate is in the high 90s. Not very high. Great. Thank you very much. One, one point of clarification just for anyone <laughs> if they didn't get it. Vera Mobility, they, they can't issue a ticket. They can dismiss a ticket. So we capture all the different incidences. Some of them get automatically dismissed, that filter that Captain Daly was talking about, and they're dismissed. And then only those that meet certain qualifications then are reviewed by one of our officers. Our officers then dismiss a bunch of those, and then only those that are clear violations where we can identify the driver tied to the registration get issued a ticket. Help me remember approximately what number percentage of incidents turn into tickets? It's about 20%. So of, this, of the citations that we review, we actually only, we issue about 20%. And we have a very uh, liberal approach to it. It's not a black and white. So right. like a right on red into the mall, unless there's some other contributing factor, we typically dismiss those. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, you know the reason I ask that because one of the complaints that I've heard about these systems is that I guess in some jurisdictions, it's actually the contractor who makes that determination of issuing the citation. Um, and so, um, I mean, I, and I'm pleased to hear that we don't use that kind of approach and that the officers actually uh, do that. Right. And, and that may be like uh, uh, one of the things is California is that it, it's a driver uh, responsibility. Other states go into a uh, where the vehicle's at fault yeah. or they can assign the fault to the vehicle, much like a parking ticket. Right. Um, but that's in a lot of other states. California is, is, is driver responsibility. So we actually have to have we it would be you know we have to have a picture of the driver and then we have to compare it if there's uh if we can't do that then we typically don't issue it okay thank you council member bertrand you had a question you know so that, that was one of my questions but that clears that up um are there any other spots along 41st or any other street in capitol that you think this might um, benefit us in terms of reducing accidents 
actually back in 2000, but well, prior to the installation of the cameras, they actually did a pretty extensive survey on 41st Avenue. And uh, initially they had, uh, I believe both north and southbound approaches monitored. And we realized that the, the vast majority of the violations were on the southbound approaches. And, and they actually identified those intersections as being the most relevant for, for the system itself. Okay, and um, just for people listening and those here in the audience, um, do we share any of this information with any state agencies or federal agencies? No, absolutely not. Okay, that's good to hear. Thank you very much. Councilmember Bertrand, one other point that I think may be relevant to your question is, is that we, we only have two approaches on two intersections, red light camera, but the benefits, the accident data benefits spill over to the entire corridor. Good point. Um, so I think if we were looking at these data right here and we were seeing that the specific intersections that had the cameras were seeing drastic injury re accident re reductions and the corridor as a whole wasn't, then I think the question of should we consider deploying more of them would be a really logical one. I think in this case, people just associate the 41st Avenue corridor with having red light cameras and be drive differently in that entire corridor. So I would say what we have is working. Okay. Thank you. Um, any further council questions? I just have one question. Um, it, it looks like we're going for a five-year contract for this. If by some amazing chance we win a year and no one's run any red lights, we're not issuing any tickets, Do we? is there any kind of opt-out contract if it's determined we don't need this anymore? Or how does that, how would that work? So so there is actually a termination clause in the, in the current contract. Um, it, the, it's based on it's a prorated rate so if we were to um, it would be more if we were to say if we were to adopt this and, and a week from now cancel it obviously that amount would be higher than maybe the week before the five-year uh, expiration um, part of it though is that this is a no cost so if, if no one ran red lights it would be wise of us to just let continue with the contract and once it expires it, we would just fulfill that great thank you all right uh, is there any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council for uh, further comment and deliberation and a vote. I move we extend it for another five years. I, I will second that motion, um, but I would like to maybe add some comments Please, about yes. because um, I was here on the council when we originally put them in, um, and. They were very controversial when they first went in, and to some extent, they still are. A lot of people claim that they're unconstitutional, they're unfair, um, um, and it's just a means for the city to make a lot of money. But um, I, I think I'm very proud of the results that we've seen in terms of safety. Um, and I think our police department need the tools that they need uh, or, or have available to um, be able to um, uh, increase public safety in, in places that they can't be. You can't be everywhere in the city. Um, and, uh, um, and I think the data speaks for itself. Uh, so um, with that, I think the benefits of these cameras far outweigh um, the issues. Uh, and not, I'm not going to deny that maybe there are some, but I think we've handled them very well. This is not a means for the city to make money. It's to increase safety and to provide tools to our uh, police department. And I will, and I would, and I think that you know, as we're looking at the mall project, um, we're going to need to look at more technology in order to uh, one control, minimize um, the traffic uh, in that area, um, and to you know, continue to increase and emphasize public safety. So those are the reasons why I'm going to second that motion and support it. Okay. Comment, yes, please. Um, you were on the city council at that time. Yes. I was in the audience at that time, and I was pretty upset about the motion to oh, bring those contacts. That was you, huh? Yeah, I was very upset about it because uh, same things. And um, sharing of information is one of the main things that I was worried about and we don't do that so i'm covered and the reduction of accidents is a no-brainer for me great we have a motion and a second any further comments okay 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Captain Dowd. We're going to move on to our last item of the evening, item 8C, discuss developing a code of conduct. Do we have a staff report? Sure, Mayor Peterson, members of the council. So last fall, council directed staff to prepare an agenda item to come back and talk about developing a potential code of conduct for the city. Um, in general, codes of conducts identify a sort of a set of values, rules for office holders uh, to help for, for them to help sort of govern how they interact with each other and how they go about fulfilling the responsibilities uh, to the city. Um, Codes of conduct can apply, they always, almost always apply to city councils, and sometimes they can also apply to members of other city boards and commissions. Usually there's some segments that apply to all boards and commissions and others that are just strictly to council. So as part of a process to understand a little bit more about codes of conduct, we reviewed um, multiple co um, codes that were developed by other jurisdictions. They really varied. Uh, some of them were a single page, which was really just sort of a statement of values about how they intended to interact with each other. Others were quite comprehensive documents. Uh, as documents got more comprehensive, they would expand upon the values that they sort of shared and they expected each other to uh, all uphold to usually include more examples of maybe how they might interact with um, other city resources. Um, that is, how council members communicated with staff and provided direction to staff. Um, with uh, other boards and commissions, other non-city bodies, whether they would be unified in conveying a message if the city had, for example, supported a measure, but maybe an individual council member opposed it, how that would take place. And then lastly, some of the more robust examples include procedures to investigate and ultimately sort of adjudicate potential violations um, and potentially penalties associated with it. So. We've looked at numbers of different ways, and the staff report outlines a couple of different options about how to develop a code of conduct. I think thinking about, in a lot of cities, I think looking at the, the situations that they're in when they develop a code of conduct, it's often um, sort of robust issues that are taking place at the time. We don't have that, and I think my suggestion about how to move forward would be to form an ad hoc subcommittee of a couple of council members who are here this evening to work with staff. We can review a couple of codes of conduct internally and then come back with a recommendation to the full council. So with that, uh, I'm available for questions. Any questions for staff? Yes, Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, um, so I notice you, you have a section in here on how to proceed um, the ad hoc, but also scheduling meetings and workshops and stuff like that. Can you expand your thoughts on that from staff perspective? Well, so I think the staff report outlines a couple of different options about how to prepare um, a code of conduct. And one of, one of the options to prepare a code of conduct would be to bring in, hold sort of a workshop or retreat and really spend a significant amount of time as a body debating kind of what the values and, the, and how we should craft a code of conduct. I don't think in this case that's necessary. Frankly, I'll be honest with you, in reviewing a lot of codes of conduct, there was a lot of repetition between them. So I think that a lot of that process, different bodies put themselves through. At the end of the day, the outcome was often quite similar to what other jurisdictions did. And in some cases, the process may have been more intended to resolve some internal disputes rather than really focused on the document. So my recommendation is the forming the ad hoc committee. We can certainly explore other options about how to go about doing this. Once it's in place, uh, as a council, you may want to ask to hold a training with other boards and commissions. I think you brought that up at the last meeting about how, how best everyone can uphold the standards that are in it. Uh, that's certainly something we could look at once we have a code of conduct done. Just, what, what I, um, Sam, would you want to say something? Well, I, I just wanted to add that as part of this process, I reached out to the other city attorneys in my firm and said, you know, who <laughs> works with cities that have protocols, codes of conduct, and I think I got like 30 in response i mean and jamie is right they are all over the map and some are very um prescriptive about sort of in, in healdsburg we have uh, probably one of those 25 page documents it's really a set of protocols is it shorter oh great it might be <laughs> thanks to me um it, it's really sort of um prescriptive about you know how to put something on the agenda what the goal setting session looks like each year it's sort of a more of a guidebook and then at the other end there are some that are more 
focused on the kind of behavior of council members. And those are the kinds of things that I think are very difficult to navigate when you get to a point where you need them. And so I heartily agree that it's a good thing to do when you don't necessarily need a code of conduct. And you're all very genial. So follow up to my question to you, Jamie, is that I just don't want to be in a position where we don't keep it alive. You know, it's there in the books, so to speak, but we don't revisit it every year or every two years. And, um, you know, I think this was initially brought up for a good reason and perhaps it wouldn't have been brought up if we had something on the books and we kept it alive and people were aware of the fact that we need to have good contact between the various commission members and city council members. Sorry to interrupt. Um, this is for questions. Do you have any additional questions? Because um, we can come back for comment. It just yeah. hasn't gone to public comment yet, yeah, so, so we just okay, have questions right now. Except that. No problem. No? Okay. No more questions. Uh, questions? No questions. No? No questions? Okay. Any member of the public like to address the council on this item? Saying none, we'll bring it back for comment. Council Member yeah. Bertrand. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, what was I saying? <laughs> okay, so I think I already said it. I, I just want this to be something that currently, you know, our state requirements are we take all these different online courses every year. It's sort of in the same vein. You know, I have to admit I miss them all the time, but still. <laughs> Any further comments? Nope. No? Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, sure. I um, I agree with the staff recommendation. I think it's a great idea to begin the process um, of creating an ad, ad hoc subcommittee. And I think um, I'd like to be on it. And I'd also like to um, nominate my my count my pal over here, <laughs> Council Member Story, to join me on that um, on that subcommittee. Um, and then, in hopes that we can create create this code of conduct and bring it back to Council for review and approval. And to come up with a plan on implementation, I think um, you've heard it many times before from me um, about the onboarding process. And we really need to um, tie those two things in together. And we're already up here and it might it's never too late to, to um, implement a process of, of onboarding, um, which would include hopefully this code of conduct and anything else council would see fit. But I'm hoping that council member story would agree of joining me on this subcommittee <laughs> well in anticipation of being compliant with this anticipated new code of conduct I accept <laughs> <coughs> that's the first rule of the code of conduct you have to agree when you're not <laughs> exactly. yes. I got a question though so Yvette what do you mean by onboarding oh so onboarding is like when you come on to, into a new position or a new job and you've never done it before and so like understanding Robert's rules of order or um, understanding protocol of being a council member and how motions are made and all of that sort of stuff similarly to planning commission who follows the same ru uh, rules mm -hmm. most people who are appointed or elected generally don't go through that type of training and I think it's important to know those things um, before you take take the seat but sometimes that doesn't happen in addition other jurisdictions have code of conduct and so they implement that guiding principles they review the city's budget all of that kind of training that should actually take place before you know a meet your first meeting I think that's really important so that you have your leg ahead um, mm -hmm. when you're up here okay, do we need to vote on this or just of, do we need to vote to form this ad hoc sub subcommittee? I think there's a motion and a second actually on the floor. Was there a motion? Um, I'll make a mo it, it says a discussion. Uh, oh, action. So um, I make a motion. motion. It doesn't, right? It's a discussion item? You should make a motion. We're trying to figure out if you've actually made the motion. I, I, I didn't. Think you did. I, didn't. I think no, you just suggested I don't think it. that was a motion. Yeah. That's funny. I heard a motion and a second. But I, I said I, it, but not as a motion. <laughs> No um, so I'll make a motion to um, approve staff recommendations to form a city council ad hoc subcommittee um, with myself and council member story to work with staff to create a draft code of a conduct policy for review by the full city council after we're done with it we have a motion do we have a second come on Sam oh well I'm, <laughs> I'm on the committee so I thought maybe <laughs> I'll, okay, second. I'll second, I'll second. <laughs> We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. And that concludes our meeting.
that concludes our meeting. Uh, have a great evening. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night. <coughs>